Hey everyone, welcome. Today we're continuing to work on the leak code graph questions, so all the questions that haven't been checked here. So before we get started, we should take a look at an idea in graphs, and that's the topological sort process. So this process is going to be super important for the next two questions, course schedule and course schedule two. So essentially, what is a topological sort? So topological sort is a graph algorithm that we can use on directed graphs. So in this graph here, we have graphs with nodes and edges. These edges are all directed. For example, this purple edge is directed from zero to two. So what topological sort does is that it wants a sorting starting from nodes with zero in degree and all the way proceeding to the final node here, four. So what in degree means is the number of arrows that are pointing to a node. For example, this node here is zero. This one has zero in degree because no nodes are pointing to it. This node two, it has one in degree because this purple arrow is pointing to it. Here one also has one in degree because the pink arrow is pointing to it. Three has two in degree because there are two green arrows pointing to three. And four has four in degree because there's four orange arrows pointing to it. So we can see that there's a in degree hash map hashing every node to the number of arrows pointing to it, with zero having zero in degree. So in topological sort, we want to start with nodes that have zero in degree, for example, this zero here. Then from the zero, we can proceed to all of its children. So the two, the one, and the four. We're going to look at the in degree of these children. So after we remove this purple arrow by processing zero, two no longer has any prerequisites or in degrees. So two is the next node that we can process. We can process the green arrow and this orange arrow here to subtract one from the in degrees of three and four. So after that, we can process one because one also has one in degree, which depends on zero. So after zero is done, we can do one. So one has two children, three and four. So after dealing with the green arrow, then three no longer has any dependencies. It has zero in degree now. So we can process from three to four and then all of four's dependencies or zero, one, and three, and two. These are all processed. So four has no in degree and we can do four. So this idea is super helpful in questions like course schedule, where in course schedule, we have courses that depend on previous courses. For example, we can only take course two if we've taken course zero, in which case we want to take zero first, then two. So in this question, or not in this question, in this algorithm, we often have a process with a hash map. So the hash map or a counter data structure counts the in degree of all of the nodes. We also have a Q or a DQ. So this tracks which courses or nodes are available. So at the start, the only available ones will be the ones with in degree zero. Then we're going to subtract in degrees from the courses that are dependent on. So for example, we take course zero, then we can take course two. So two becomes available and we want to insert it into the queue. And finally, the array or the order is a valid ordering for us to take the courses. A valid ordering is that we take all the courses that have dependencies after their dependencies. So taking course two first, then course zero is not a valid ordering, but taking zero first and then two is a valid ordering. So some questions like course schedule two is going to ask us to find that valid ordering. So to initialize this, first we want to add nodes with zero in degree, so node zero here, into sources, and then we can begin our algorithm. So starting off with the first question, let's take a look at course schedule. So in course schedule, there's a total num courses courses that we have to take labeled from zero to num courses, minus one. So we have an array prerequisites. Prerequisites A, B indicates that we have to take course A before, we, oh sorry, we can must take course B if you want to take course A. So taking course A depends on course B. For example, if we have the course 0 and course 1, we have to take 0 first, then we can take course 1. So this question asks us, is it possible to finish all the courses? If it's possible, return true, otherwise return false. So this is a classic topological sort idea, because each course depends on previous courses, so we want to find a valid ordering for us to take the courses. Otherwise, we should return false. If we can find a true ordering, then return true. So like we described in the diagram, we're going to create a topological sort algorithm. So to code that up, first we need to have an adjacency list. An adjacency list is a dictionary in Python. We're going to use a default disk, default dictionary with initialized to list. So what the adjacency list stores is the 
postrequisites or the courses that we're allowed to take after taking a course. For example, we're allowed to take course one, sorry, we're allowed to take course zero only after we take course one. So zero is going to be in the list that is hashed by course one. So we know that what courses we can subtract one in degree from after taking course one. So we should also have a counter, let's call that in degree. So this is a counter that counts how many dependencies each course has. So now let's look at our prerequisites. So for A, B in prerequisites, so the adjacency list of B should append list A, sorry, course A. And then A has one more prerequisite. So prereq now in degree of A plus equals to one because A depends on B. So for every course that A depends on, the in degree is going to increase by one, just like we saw in the previous picture. So now we should also have a Q in Python, we're going to do a DQ. So available courses is a DQ. This is going to be empty at the start and we should also have our answer. So the answer is the number of courses taken. To return true or false, we're going to compare taken with the total number of courses. If we've taken all of them, then we want to return true. Otherwise, we want to return false. So now we can begin our topological sort with that setup out of the way. So first, the first step in topological sort says add nodes with zero in degree to sources. So for course in range num courses, so let's take a look at every single course. If it has zero in degree, so in degree course equals to zero, then we should be adding it to our available courses. That means we can actually take this course. So avail.append our course here. So now we have the initial setup. Now we can start taking a look at the courses that we're uh, that's available to us right at the beginning. So while then avail is greater than zero, while there's still available courses, let's take a look at that course. So course equals to avail.poplapt. We want to pop from the left because it's a FIFO queue and the number of courses taken plus equals to one because we can take this course called course right here. So after that, we're going to be looking at the next courses that are branching off or that are depending on the current course. So for next course in our adjacency list hashed by course in degree of the next course is going to decrease by one. So in degree next course decreases by one because we're taking a dependency. So now the number of dependencies or the in degree decreases by one. So if in degree of the next course equals to zero, that means it's available to be taken. So we should want to take it and to take it, we're going to add it to our avail DQ. So avail dot append, we want to append our next course. So next course. Finally, we're done all, all of our courses that are possible to be taken. So we want to see if taken is equal to the number of courses. So return taken equals to num courses. So if taken equals to the number of courses, that means every course has been taken and we should return true because we can finish all courses. Otherwise we want to return false if taken is not equal to num courses. So let's try running that. For A, B, and I think I spelled that wrong. Cool. So let's submit it. So this is a classic topological sort idea where we're creating a topological sort. And also during the sorting, we're recording the number of courses. Every time we take one, we increase taken by one. So to answer the question, we're basically checking if we've taken every course, because if we have, then that means we can take every course. Otherwise, we want to return false because we cannot. So moving on to the next question, course schedule two. So this question, and there are a total of num courses labeled from zero to num courses minus one. So this is just like before. We're also given an array of prerequisites where prerequisites i equals a i b i indicates we take course b if first if we want to take course a. So just like before. Now we want to return the ordering of courses we should take to finish all courses. So this is exactly the same as the diagram here. 
basically we want to return a valid ordering. So for in this, in this case, we can take zero, then two, then one, then three, then four. So that's a valid ordering. So there could also be multiple. If there's multiple valid answers, we can return any of them. If it's impossible, we return an empty array. So looking at example one here, we have to take zero to take one. So let's take zero first and then take one. So that's a valid ordering. In this case, it's a bit more complicated, but we can take zero, two, one, three, so that there's no course that whose dependency is not taken when it is taken. And in this case, there's no prerequisites. We just return zero. Makes sense. So in this question, we can have a very similar code structure to the previous question. So let's create our adjacency list. This is a default dictionary with a list. And we should also count the prerequisites or in degree equals to a counter, just like before. So for a, b, in prerequisites, we want to have adjacency list b append a, so we know what to take after we take a, and prereq for in degree of a should increase by one because it has one more dependency. So now we set up the avail dq just like before, and we set up our answer. Answer is going to be a list. So th this answer is the order that we can take, that we should take to finish all the courses. So now for course in range num courses, again, we want to look at all the courses with in degree zero. So if in degree of course equals to zero, that means we can take it right off the bat. So avail.append our course. So now while learn avail is greater than zero, while there's still courses that we can take, the course that we should take is going to be the leftmost one because it's a FIFO queue. So avail dot pop left. And we should take this course, so let's add it to our answer. So now we want to look at the next courses that branch off of this course. So for next course in adjacency list of our current course. Let's check the prereq count. So first, let's decrease the prereq count. Prereq for in degree of next course. This minus equals to one. So if in degree of the next course equals to zero, that means we can take it. So let's add it to our avail. So avail.append next course. Finally, what do we want to return? We want to return our answer because answer is the ordering that we can take all the courses. So return answer. But remember, it's possible that we might not be able to finish all the courses. So we should only return answer if our answer is the same size as num courses. That means we've taken every course in num courses. So return ants if and only if lan ants equals to num courses. Otherwise, we want to return an empty array, so just like that. Else empty array. Let's try running that. Num courses. Missed an S here. Cool. So this question is basically the same structure as the previous course schedule question. The only real difference is instead of keeping track of the number of courses we took, we actually want the actual the order of the courses. So whenever we take a course, we want to append it to this list of answers, and in the end, we want to compare if answers is the same number of courses as num courses. If it is, we want to return this ordering, otherwise we return an empty array. So moving on to the next question, count connected components. So this question, we're given an undirected graph with n nodes. There's also an edges array where edges i, a, b means there's an edge between node a and node b. So we want to return the total number of connected components in the graph. So with this input, let's look at example one here. There's three nodes, edges are 0, 1, and 0, 2. So node 0 is connected to 1, it's also connected to 2. That means 1 and 2 are also connected, so everything is connected, and the output is 1 because there's only one connected component. So in example 1 here, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, so these are all connected. But nodes 4 and 5 are not connected to 0, 1, 2, or 3. So that means that there's two connected components in example 2. So to code this question, this is going to be another adjacency list question where we want to store all of its neighbors in an adjacency list. So after that, we can just do a depth for search. So this is the same idea as the number of islands question we did in the first part of the graphs question. 
So in that number of islands question, we basically do a DFS on every single node that hasn't been visited yet. So if that cell hasn't been visited, that is a valid island, otherwise it's not. So then finally in the answer, we check how many times we called our DFS function and we turn that as the output because that's the number of connected components or connected islands like before. So starting off, first we're going to create our adjacency list. So adj equals to default, di default dictionary. Default dictionary with a list. And we should keep track of which nodes we visited so we don't call DFS on them again. So visited equals to a set. So for a, b, and edges, we're taking a look at every edge in our edges. So adjacency list a dot append b because b is adjacent to a and a is also adjacent to b. So because this is undirected, we want to have it go both ways. So adjb also appends a. So the difference between this adjacency list is, and the previous one is that this is a undirected graph, which means we have to go both ways. Before we only had to go one way. So now let's create our DFS function that we want to call on every single node. So to find DFS, DFS should take in our current node, so let's call that node. So if we visited before, so if node in visited, we don't want to visit again, so we can just return. Now visited should add node to make sure we don't visit it again in the future, so visited.add node. Now let's look at all of the node's neighbors, so for neighbor in adjacency list of a node. So looking at all the nodes we can go to for my current node, we want to call DFS on that. So let's call DFS on neighbor. So our answer is going to be the number of connected components, and that's going to be initialized to zero. Now we want to call our DFS function on every number from zero to n minus one, and we want to keep track of the number that we haven't called DFS on. So basically the number of times we call DFS, and we only call DFS if node is not in visited. So for i in range n, this is all the numbers or all the nodes. If i is not in visited, so not in visited, that means we haven't called DFS on this before, which means we should increase our answer by one. It's a new connected component, and we should call DFS on our current node. So DFS on i. After we've done the DFS on every single node, we can just return answer because that's the number of connected components. Let's try running that. Cool. Nice, that worked. So this question is basically number of islands, except instead of searching four ways to the top, bottom, left, and right, just like in the islands question, we're searching our adjacency list. So for if we're doing for neighbor instead of for change in row and column. But other than that, it's basically the same idea. The only difficult part is that we have to set adjacency list A and B to append each other because it's a undirected graph, which means it goes both ways. So moving on to the next question, redundant connection. So redundant connection, we want to find, in this problem, we're going given a tree, which is an undirected graph that has connected and has no cycles. So we're given a graph that starts as a tree with nodes from n nodes labeled from one to n. So with one additional edge added. So initially we have a tree. So a tree has n minus one edges, and then we're adding another edge. So we have n edges. The added edge has two different vertices chosen from one to n, and it's not an edge that already is ex existed. So this graph is represented with an array edges of length n where edges i equal ai bi indicates there's an edge between ai and bi. So we want to return an edge that can be removed so that resulting graph is a tree of n nodes. If there's multiple answers, we want to return the answer that occurs last in the input. So let's look at some examples here. In example one, we have edges 1, 2, 1, 3, and 2, 3. So except these nodes are connected like a triangle. We want to remove one of the edges so that this we don't have a redundant connection. So first, 1, 2 is connected. Only the top edge exists. There's no redundant connections. Then we have 1, 3. So 1, 3, this vertical one. And finally, we have 2, 3. But notice that 2 and 3 are already connected because they can go through 1. So this edge from 2 to 3, this is redundant. And we want to return that. 
We can return any of these in this question, but we want to return the one that occurs last in the input because the question wants us to return that. So we want to return 2, 3 in this case. Moving on to the next example, example 2, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The redundant connection is anything in this cycle because this is a cycle with four edges, we can return any of those. But we want to return the one that appears last, which is going to be 1, 4. We can't remove 1, 5 because cutting this means that we have two different connected components and we don't want that. We want a tree which is all connected. So this question is actually a little bit difficult because it requires an algorithm called union find. So if we don't have union find, we can try adding every single edge to the adjacency list and running a DFS to check if we've reached every single node. But this is going to be really complicated because DFS takes O of V time or O of N time based on the number of nodes and we want to do that for every edge added. There's going to be N edges, so it's going to be O of N squared time complexity. And that's going to be too complex for what we want, so we want a new algorithm called union find. So essentially, union find is looking for the parent of all the edges. So when we add a new edge, for example, 2, 3, we look for the parents of 2 and parents of 3. So in this case, the parent of 2 is going to be 1. We're going to assign 1 to be the parent, and parent of 3 is also 1. So if 2 and 3 have the two same parent, that means they're connected through that parent. So this edge between 2 and 3 is going to be redundant. So the way we determine whether a node is a parent or a child is based on the size of the connected component. So for example, first we connect 1 and 2. So this connected component has a size of 2, or 1 has one child. 3 has no child, so 3 is smaller when we add the edge 1, 3. 3 is going to be the child of the parent of 2, which is 1. So that's how we determine which node is the parent and which node is the child. So with that out of the way, we can check 2, 3. We realize they have the same parent, and we realize this, no this edge is actually redundant. So let's put that into code. First, actually, let's create an n. n is the number of nodes, which is also equal to the length of edges. So now we have to create a dictionary of parents. So if 1 is 2's parent, then parent of 2 should, go, should call 1. We also want to keep track of the number of children each parent has, because that's how we determine whether a node should be a parent or a child. So children equals to a counter. Counter is going to count the number of children. So for i in range n, we're going to set each parent, sorry, the parent of each node to be itself, because at the start we don't have any edges, so we're not sure which parent each node has. So its parent is going to be itself. So parent i plus 1 is equal to i plus 1. We're doing i plus 1 because these nodes are not 0 index, they're 1 index, so we need to do i plus 1. So now let's define a helper function that we need to use called find parent. Because whenever we're adding a new edge, we want to find the parent, for example, the parent of 3 and the parent of 2. And we want to compare if the parents are the same. If they're the same, that means this connection here is redundant. So define find parent. So finding parent takes in the current node. So p equals to the parent of the node. But parent, we want to find parent recursively because p's parent could be 1, 1's parent could be something else. So two, we want to find 2's greatest parent or the grandparent or the great-great-grandparent or so on. Basically the parent of 2's parents. So p equals parent of node while p is not equal to parent p. So if we can still go up, because remember the p's parent is itself, if there's no more parents, because we set the parent of each node to be itself at the start. So for example, one is its parent is going to be itself because it has no more parents. So p, so while we haven't reached that ending condition, p equals the parent of p. After that, we can just return p, the parent. So now we're looking at all the nodes a, b. So for a, b in edges, so we're looking at every single edge and we want to check if this edge is redundant. So to check if it's redundant, we need to know the parents. So PA and PB, let's let that be the parents of A and B respectively. So PA, PB equals to find parent on A and find parent on B. 
So if PA equals to PB, remember that we said that if this is the case, that means A and B are connected through their parent. So the connection between A and B is redundant. So we want to return the redundant connection, which is AB. So if this is not the case, either A should be the child of B or B should be the child of A. So to compare which one should be the child, we need to see the number of children each node already has. So if children PB or PA is greater than children PB, so if A has more children, or the parent of A has more children than the parent of B, then B should be a subchild. So parent PB equals to PA. The parent of B becomes the, uh, yeah, the parent of B is the parent of A. So now we want to increase the number of children, PA, by the number of children already in PB. Plus equals children, PB. So otherwise in the else clause, we want to do parent, PA, well, basically the opposite. So the parent of PA is PB, and the number of children in PB should increase correspondingly, so plus equals children in PA. So if we weren't able to return something in this for loop, then we should just return nothing. But in this question, I think we're never going to reach here because it's always guaranteed that we're going to have a one redundant connection. So let's try running it. Oh, it's parent. Okay. Cool, that worked. So this question, the algorithm that we use is called union find. This algorithm is a little bit out of scope to the questions in here, but if we don't use union find, we can also run a DFS algorithm, basically adding one edge at a time and then running DFS on any of the nodes to check if we have reached all, every single possible node. If we have, then future the next edge is going to be redundant after here. But with union find, we can do this in O of n time with finding parents. There's one more thing I wanted to say about find parent. We can do this thing called node compression or edge compression. Basically, whenever we have P, or let's draw an example here. So we have our node, we have its parent, and then we have its grandparent. So one thing we can do here is have node point directly to the grandparent. So if we were to check this node again, we will save and skip one step. But this question doesn't really require that. This is a little bit more advanced and we can only do this, we should only do this if we require further optimization. So moving on to the next question. So the next question, valid tree. We're given n nodes labeled from zero to n minus one and a list of undirected edges. Each edge is a pair of nodes and we write a function to check whether these edges make up a valid tree. So in graph theory, what is a tree? So a tree has n nodes and it has n minus one edges. So as well, a tree is also all connected, so which also means that there are no cycles. So these are the main properties of a tree and we wanna check if these edges make up a valid tree. So this property all connects and no cycles, these two go hand in hand and are basically the same thing. We can only, we can check for either of them to make sure it's a valid tree. The idea behind this is that if it, it's all connected, that means it takes up n minus one edges to connect all n nodes. Think about them like in a straight line. That, all, that means there are no cycles. So if there is one cycle, that means we need n edges to connect to the n nodes to make a cycle, like at minimum. So which contradicts the point that we have n nodes and n minus one edges. So we can check one of these, either check that it's all connected or we check there's no cycles. It's a little bit easier to check that it's all connected. We can do that with a DFS and a visited set. So we're going to check that first we have n minus one edges and also that it's all connected. So let's start off by creating our adjacency list just like before. So adjacency list equals do a default dict. And that is going to be initialized to a list. After that, we should also have a set that's visited. So with our DFS, we want to try to visit every node. And when we visit the, that node, we should add it to the visited set. So now populating our adjacency list for a b in edges, adjacency list of a dot append b and adjacency list of b dot append a because a tree is in this case undirected. So all of a's, so a is connected to b and b is also connected to a. 
So now let's create our DFS function. We've done this many times. So define DFS and it passes in a parameter as our current node. So if our current node is visited, so if node is visited, that means we just want to return. We don't need to do anything else. So now we want to add node to visited so we don't visit it in the future. So visited.add node. So after adding to visited, we want to add uh, also DFS on all of its neighbors. So visit all of these nodes neighbors. So our neighbor in adjacency list of our current node, we want to call DFS on that neighbor. So DFS neighbor. So now we can call DFS on literally any of these nodes. So let's call DFS on zero. We can call it on any of them because all DFS does is populating the visited set. And we want to check if the visited set is equal to n. In other words, if all of these nodes are connected to node zero. So if we can reach all n nodes from node zero, that means we have a tree that is all connected. So finally, we want to return whether or not it's a tree. So first, we need to check that the length of the edges. So there's n minus one edges. So length of edges equals to n minus one. Because the question says there will be no duplicate edges, so we're safe to do this checking. And after that, we should also check that len visited equals to n. Like I said before, DFS will populate visited to be all the nodes that are connected to zero. So if all n nodes are connected to zero, that means they're all connected. And if both conditions are true, we have a tree. So let's try running that. Cool. So this question is pretty straightforward. The code structure is similar to the previous question, this one where we're checking for the components with a DFS approach. So in this case, we need to know the properties of a tree from graph theory, namely that there's n nodes and minus one edges and there's no cycles or that they're all connected. So to check if it's all connected, we're using DFS to check there's n minus one edges. We just compare the length of edges to n minus one because we know there are no duplicate edges. So moving on to the next question, word ladder. So in word ladder, a transformation sequence we want to make a transformation sequence from our begin word to end word. And we can only use a dictionary word list as a sequence of words from begin word all the way to end word. Basically, every adjacent pair of words can only differ from a single letter. And every time in a word, uh, for every SI, they must be in word list. So basically, every intermediate word, including the end word, not including the end word, they have to be in the word list. Begin word does not have to be in the word list. So let's look at an example here. We have begin word hit and end word cog. So the word list is these words right here. Basically, we want to find the shortest transformation from hit to cog. And the shortest one is going to be five words long. It's going to be hit, hot, dot, dog, and cog. So the transformation includes the first word. Hit is also one of them. So And it's going to be five words long, including the begin word and end word. So one, two, three, four, five. So because we want to find the shortest transformation sequence, that means we're going to use a BFS because BFS does it layer by layer. So we're guaranteed to hit the shortest one first before any longer transformations. And when we hit the end word, then we want to just return the length of that transformation sequence. So we're going to use BFS. And remember in BFS, we usually use a DQ, DQ approach to record all the nodes at the current level. So BFS equals to a DQ. At the start, the very first level, all we have is the first word and the last, uh, sorry, only the first word. So at the start, let's add begin word. And that has a length of one because it counts begin word as a word as well. So we have words word list as a list. We wanna have word list as a set instead of a list because it's easier for us to use sets to track which word is in word list. Sets is easier to find which whether a word is in word list or not because it has a time complexity of O of one since sets use hashing while arrays, we have to check every single word in the array. So it has a complexity of O of n. That's why we want word list to be a set. So let's call that set words and words is going to be a set created from word list. So after that, let's start our BFS approach. So while len BFS is greater than zero. So while there's still elements that we can reach, the word and the sequence length, let's call that sequence length, 
this is going to be the leftmost element because BFS is a FIFO cube. So BFS op left. So it's possible that we reach the end word already. So if word equals to end word, then we want to return our sequence line. Sequence line. Let's return that. So return sequence line. So now suppose we didn't reach the end word, then we want to check all of this word's neighbors. So to get the neighbors of a word, we're going to be trying to change one character from the word at a time. So for example, hit, let's try all the possible characters replacing this H, then try all the possible characters replacing I, and, and then T, and so on. Whenever we replace a character, for example, AIT, BIT, CIT, we need to check whether AIT is in word list or not. So only if the new word that is one character different from hit is in the word list, then we want to put that new word into our DQ or BFS, and then we check that after. So to do that in Python, let's create a for loop iterating every possible character index in the word. So for i in range land word, we're going to try to change the character at the current index. So what character do we change it to? Well, we can change it to any possible character in the English alphabet. So for character in there is a special thing in Python, string.ascii lowercase. So string.ascii lowercase is basically a string that contains the characters a, to a, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way until Z, all in lowercase. So we try every single character in string.ascii lowercase. So let's create our new word. New word equals to word from zero all the way to I. So the first part of the word plus this new character that we're replacing and plus the remainder of the word, which is word i plus one all the way until the end. So this way, the character at index i is getting replaced. Words from zero to i does not contain i because the end part is non-inclusive. So we need to check if the new word is actually a valid word. So we check if the new word is in word list. If new word in, not word list, but instead the set, we're checking from the set because checking from the set is time complexity O of one. So if new word is in words, what we want to do is add that to our BFS. So BFS.append, what are we appending? We're appending the new word. And the distance from the begin word is going to be one greater than before. So sequence length has to be plus one. So now we want to make sure we don't add this new word to BFS again, because adding in the future will always be slower or have a longer sequence length. So a trick we can do is just remove it from the word list or words dot remove and we remove our new word just so we never hit this new word again so after that this bfs loop is going to find our optimal sequence and we're going to return zero if the bfs loop cannot find it because this question says return zero if no such sequence exists so we return zero outside here let's try running it nice so this question, it says it's hard, but it's not too difficult. All we do is a BFS approach, starting from our begin word, then we try every word by replacing one character at a time in every possible index. So with this for loop right here, this nested for loop to check if we can replace one character at a time and see if that new word that we generate by replacing the character is actually in word list. So if it is, we want a BFS.pend with a new sequence plus one because that's a neighbor and it takes one more time or one more transformation to get to the new word. And eventually we're going to hit our n word, in which case we return the length of the sequence. If we never hit n word, then we're going to exit our len BFS once we have no more words to search, in which case we're going to return zero. So that's that question. It's accepted. Nice. So that's all the questions and solutions from the Nico roadmaps graph questions. Hope you're able to learn something. Thank you guys so much for watching. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks, guys.